Welcome to episode 288 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy, Montana Seahawker Adam Emmert. Yeah, man. Excited to be with you today. A lot of free agency news. It's been uh, kind of fast and furious out there. A lot of big names moving around. But I, before we get going too much, uh-huh. I came up with a title for today's podcast. Oh. Um, and it might be a little lengthy, so just bear with me for a second. But it's nice to join you today on the What the Catfish is John Schneider doing? Oh, oh, wait, that makes sense. Podcast. <laughs> that's our podcast today. Hey, you even worked in a, a Catfish in there, too. So that's yeah. uh, that works. You know, it's it's weird that you mentioned that because, you know, just with everything going on. Yes, that's all the free agency talk. But I realize that it feels like it's been a while since we've done this. And the reason why it feels like it's been a while the last time you and I recorded a show together, Adam, mm-hmm. major sports leagues were playing in front of arenas crowded full of people. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder why that got shut down. Yeah. Remember yeah. Re- remember those times? It, it seems like Back only a week day? ago. Yeah, only a week ago. Well, that's one of the things, too, that uh, we may consider is uh, doing this a little more often here over the next few months since uh, everybody's a little cooped up. Yeah. And uh, there's only so much content that gets put out you know, as an aggregate over Seahawks news. And so maybe we need to add to that a little bit more so that uh, people get their fix. We're going to we're going to add to Seahawks news. Oh, of course. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Why cool. not? I mean, are we making it up or are we just going to you know go with whatever little bits that we have here and there? Well, we make up a little bit of it. We put our spin on a little bit of it and then we just report some of it, you know, like we always do. <laughs> gotcha. OK. I, I <laughs> okay. like that idea. You know, I especially with everything that's going on, just the idea of getting together and not having to to get away from all the other stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah. focus on I mean, you know, just the normal stuff. Well, that's why yesterday was awesome for me is uh, I'm getting texts from the girlfriend. She's all freaking out because somebody in her building like had to go get tested and it was all fine. But, you know, she's freaking out. Sure. And I'm at home constantly updating bleacher report like all this stuff and i'm like hey when are we signing clowning when is why did we just sign some backup offensive lineman what the hell is going on what's going you know that that's where my head was all day yeah it was, it was just glorious in the, in the nfl it was great i didn't think about it much and it, it was fantastic so uh just thanks to the league for that uh the timing worked out really well for me the start of free agency yeah well, we're going to get into it all as it was some busy times, but it's also some downtime and gives us some reflection on years previous to what we've seen from the Seahawks. They're doing the exact same thing they seem to do every time during this period uh, of free agency. And when you look at the teams, no way, no way. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I called this the annual "What the Catfish is John Steiner doing?" podcast. I, that, that's why the title is so brilliant, Adam, because it's yeah. Uh, yeah. it's it's a reflection back on years past and a reminder of exactly why he does this every single year. So, uh, but there are some moves that have been made. We've seen some players go, although not a whole lot of players leave, and we've seen a few return. Uh, let's start off with the, uh, I guess, the biggest news is the fact that we're still refreshing our Twitter feed, waiting for Jadevian Clowney news to, on whether he has re-signed with the Seahawks or whether he's going to another team. But as more and more days go by, especially with not getting any news on it on Wednesday, when free agency opened, that would have been the day for the Seahawks to either make an announcement or Clowney to have you know sufficiently tested the market over two days with all these other signings that we would have heard uh, some word about it. So obviously, he's not going to get a huge break the bank top of the market deal at this point. Yeah, Jadevian is uh, honestly making me a little frustrated right now. But to to show that I still want him back in a big time way, I learned how to say his first name, Jadevian. Jadevian, good job. I got it. I got it down now. <laughs> I learned it just because I feel like he needs to come back to the team. I want him back. I want him to feel welcome on a first name basis, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but Jadevian is really frustrating me right now in the sense of. The longer that he fiddle farts around waiting for some team to pony up a big offer that's not going to come, it would have already come. Like That's how free agency works. And it hasn't shown up. And so he's sitting there hoping for something larger than what the Seahawks have thrown down on the table, which I'm guessing is somewhere in the $18 million per year range, would be my guess. 
however many years, who knows? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure John Schneider threw that offer down. He's like, oh, no, I'm going to get more. And it hasn't come. And so John's not going to up the offer. He's just going to wait until he comes back and says, okay. And you get him kind of a steal. But the longer he freaking waits, the more it kind of hamstrings you to make other moves because you don't know how much cap space you need to save out for Clowney. The Giants were one of those teams that we heard that had big interest in Clowney. Now, there's a team that also is not going to be going to the playoffs this year. But if he were just solely in the market for a big payday, that may have been the team to do it. But now the Giants, they aren't going to have that kind of money. They've been spending big in free agency. Speaking of all the teams that go out and spend big, the Giants, not a good team. And here they are spending big in free agency, uh, especially through these first couple of days. So that doesn't seem like it's going to be an option for New York now because they're not going to have the space anymore. Well, as many people have pointed out, including John Clayton, that uh, the market is drying up for Clowney. And so at that point, I mean, he's not going to have a lot of other options. And Seattle might be his last option just in terms of getting the, you know, a contract that's close to what he wanted. Now, in terms of a football fit, in terms of winning, in terms of trying to get that chip, where else are you going to go? Like, that's the thing about the Giants rumors that cracked me up. <laughs> are you serious? You think Daniel Jones is leading you to the promised land in his second year at quarterback? I don't think so, man. Like, I, that, that just wasn't a destination that would interest me at all if I'm clowning. I didn't make any sense. There's been a lot of these rumors that don't make a lot of sense. I mean, I see Eagles fans kind of clamoring uh, to sign Clowney. And that one makes a little more sense to me. That because, one makes a little more sense to me, too. Because the Eagles actually do spend in free agency all the time. It's how they build their team. They, they actually caught lightning in a bottle once doing that. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to keep trying it. <sighs> but I still don't think that's a situation you look at if you're Clowney and be like, well, who knows if Carson Wentz is ever going to be healthy? Are they ever going to get a receiver? I mean, hell, they couldn't even top the Cardinals freaking offer for DeAndre Hopkins to the Texans. Like, they gave up, what, a bag of chips to get Hopkins? And, like, the Eagles were supposedly in talks and were like, nah, You're right. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going to go in on that. So it's just an organization that has a lot of areas to upgrade, wide receiver being one of them, and they're losing guys in the back end while bringing in Slay, I guess, but... It's still not a destination that I look at right now. One of the teams that is in the worst division of football and can't even win that division. Why would you go there? Well, and know. you brought up you brought up Slay going there, and that didn't even occur to me. They, I mean, they're talking about giving him a three year, fifty million dollar contract extension, thirty million dollars guaranteed. I, I don't even think the Eagles are a destination now uh, because that Slay contract is going to eat up a huge chunk of space for them now too. And what are they going to have left? So, yeah, the more and more time that goes on and you see the Seahawks you know, leaving that cap room open for Clowney to still you know, work in under the Seahawks cap. And yes, they've made several signings, but there's still room. And plus the salary cap, you know, they, they have magic ways of doing things. So I suppose you could even say that there's there's other teams out there. You know, the, the Bucks are an interesting team to me as a potential landing spot for Clowney. I guess, although they have oodles of pass rushers and that front seven's pretty good i'm not sure that they got well, jason pierre paul back but that, i could see them looking for a guy on the other end too it's possible and with uh barrett there he's a great pass rusher himself i i don't know i mean maybe if you're really going all in on the brady thing which i suppose you'd have to if you're the tampa bay buccaneers maybe you do try to spend big but i'm not sure what their cap situation looks like that's not a team i really thought much about and just remember, they just signed a quarterback to $30 million a year. Yes, that, that that'll make, take up a chunk, too. That, that makes it a little more difficult. Tom Brady. And I don't know if it's actually been like signed into existence yet. No, but it's happening. Well, happening for the Seahawks, Jaron Reed coming back to the team. And a two-year, $23 million deal, $14 million guaranteed, $10 million signing bonus. And so there's a player that maybe we weren't necessarily expecting back and back with the Seahawks for two more years. A player that didn't expect to be back either. I mean, Jaron Reed thought he was going to go out there and get the bag this year. He really did. And after being suspended and then coming back and not really popping as a pass rusher, it really worked out well for the Seahawks. This is a very team-friendly deal at the end of the day. 
in terms of just overall dollars. Mm -hmm. So as a guy that I didn't really care or want to have Jaron Reed back just because I thought some team was going to overpay in a significant way. Well, that didn't happen. And so we get him back on a pretty cheap deal. I'll take it. This, that's great. I think that's a great start. I mean, at this point, I wanted to see Clowney re-signed, one more D-tackle brought in on top of Reed, and somebody that's in the ilk of Bruce Irvin's skill set to, you know, as an older pass rusher that maybe still has a little bit that you can pick up on the cheap. And uh, we're basically... And your fourth one was things. a Fetty or a replacement for a Fetty. Right. And that, that happened as well. So, uh, you know, things are happening that are kind of lining up to uh, make the Seahawks, I think, the contender that they can be next year. And I think the Jaron Reed signing is going to be a good one for the team. I think he could have a bounce back year next year. I think he could. It's And for uh, that price, I think the Seahawks are expecting more production than they got from him last season, you know. And if you put more players around him on the defensive line, maybe that's the case. You mentioned them uh, also looking for a defensive tackle. That hasn't happened yet. I think maybe we'd even like to see an additional pass rusher as well, just because to, just to help add to that defensive line. Because so far I look at it, and I can see why some people would be upset with John Schneider at this point, because... Yes, they, they go out and they get uh, Brandon Shell as the right tackle from the Jets, who's almost a carbon copy of Jermaine Effetti, uh, down to the weight and just his uh, athletic traits and uh, his pro football focus numbers as far as production in, in the pass and, and against the run. Uh, almost exactly the same. The one big difference is that he has a third fewer penalties than <laughs> Jermaine Effetti has over the last three years. And so I see that as an improvement because how many times, really the times where we were saying, you know, Catfish! Hugh Effetti was mm -hmm. in moments of penalties. It wasn't because he was giving an overabundance of sacks up, although he had his moments where he got beat and apparently Shell gets beat fewer times than, than uh, Effetti has over the years. But it's those moments of penalties that really, I think, got under Seahawks fan skin. Oh, absolutely. My number one problem with Effetti over the years has completely been the penalties. It is absolutely ma maddening because they're mental mistakes. Those are the things that you can actually prevent. That's the type of stuff as a coach that would really drive me insane. That, that would literally, I'd be in the loony bin if I had to coach somebody like Effetti who false starts all the freaking time. And so if you're looking at Shell compared to Effetti, Effetti's playing ability as far as how he did <laughs> when the play was actually going on, it was decent enough. That wasn't the problem with him. So if I can get a guy who does that exact same thing, that's decent enough, right, in his playing ability, doesn't commit the penalties and costs half the price. Oh, and is a you know distant relative of Art Shell, yeah. you know, the Hall of Fame offensive lineman. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, and Art Shell is his great uncle, I think. Yeah, so I think that was a brilliant move by John Schneider. That one made me very happy. I think the pickup of the backup offensive lineman from the Steelers, uh, Fenny, is that his B name? Yeah, B.J. Finney. He seems like a kind of serviceable plug-and-play kind of guy. I like that. Good versatility. Uh, I, I don't know what you're doing at left guard still at this point. That's a little bit up in the air. But, uh, you know, I like the idea that John Schneider has gone out and he's really putting resources to towards both sides of the trenches. And yeah. that's exactly what I wanted to see. Well, I think the thing with Finney is that he has that flexibility to play center. He has that flexibility to play guard. He seems like an Ethan Posick replacement, which, you know, what we saw from Posick last year, he ends up going on IR. I wonder about his health. It seems like maybe he was kind of in the doghouse. So I, I kind of look at the Finney signing as maybe writing on the wall for Posick that he could be gone. Tedrick Thompson expected to be gone as the Seahawks, quote unquote, <laughs> give him permission to seek a trade. OK, uh, I want to know how that phone call goes. Right. That, let's say let's say Tedrick doesn't have a, an agent. and He's making these calls himself. <laughs> right. Can you imagine him calling up, say, I don't know, pick a team. Uh, let's say the Cincinnati Bengals. Hey, this is T, this is T2. Um, would you like to trade for me? <laughs> and they'd be like, uh, no, I don't want to give up any pick. Well, I'm just hungry. Can you send me like a bag of chips? <laughs> and then then I'll go there. Like, you know, just anything. 
There, who's trading for T2? It would have to be somebody who wants to pay him his $2 million salary next year. And I'm guessing it would be for a seventh round conditional pick. No. <laughs> if uh, I mean, Terrell that's, Casey... No, that's, that's the most that I think as Seahawks fans can hope for. Right. If Jarrell Casey is worth a seventh round pick, T2 is uh, basically if the Seahawks were to trade him, I think they would have to give the team T2 and then also like, I don't know, a third rounder just to deal with the fact that he gives up bombs all the time. Yeah, he had a couple nice interceptions. Okay. A nice guy. I mean, all that. I just, I'm done with him at the safety spot. And so are the Seahawks. And that's fine. And that's going to relieve some some cap space as well. Offensive tackle Cedric Abwehi is coming to Seattle. And oh, I, is that I, how it's done? That's how, that's how you pronounce his name, Abwehi. All right. Yeah. Well, it's going to be Cedric for me. So that's cool. <laughs> Until Cedric until he ha- until his one year deal is up and you want him back, the, and then you'll learn how to pronounce his last name. Hey man, if he plays his way into that spot, I'm I'm tickled pink. That's great. This is a guy who I see as the George Fant replacement as Fant goes to the Jets for three years, <laughs> thirty million dollars. <laughs> that cracks me up. Who that is the most Jets contract ever. Yeah, yeah for for a part time. Offensive lineman slash tight end, you paid him ten million a year. Yeah, I mean, and I love George Fant the person. Like he's a cool dude. I love the fact that he got that contract, and it's not oh, from the yeah. Seahawks. Yeah, keep getting them checks, George. But I, I just that when I saw that number, I was like, okay, you know, happy trails. Not in a million years would I pay that. Hell, people aren't even coming out and paying a Fetty that right now. I mean, there's no market for him. I guess maybe it's not surprising. It more confirms of what I think should be reality. Right. The but, eyeball test. Remember when everybody was saying somebody's going to give him the bag? Like well, he's going to he's going to get paid a, an enormous contract. Yeah. All these tackles are getting three year, $10 million deals. And I'm guessing, you know, I'm guessing maybe that deal was out there for him initially. And now I, I wonder if it is going to be. Do you think it was? If a guy like Vitae from the Eagles is getting a, a t- three-year, $30 million deal. Yeah, so a couple of the backup tackles, right? They kind of got the this three, three-year, $30 million deal, right? Yeah. But if Eddie, I don't, I honestly don't think he was offered it because I think the advantage that the guys who were the backups were is that they didn't have that much tape out there. People are basically paying for potential, whereas with a Fetty, he's been out there. The one thing, you know, bless his heart, he has been healthy. Right. And the one thing is he's been healthy, been out there, but there's a ton of tape on him enough for people to be like, why, why would I pay him a bunch of money? Like why? The Seahawks weren't going to give him that fifth year option for $10 million. So why should we, Uh, that should be a clue to the league, right? Right. After yet another year of mediocrity and boneheaded false starts. Very interesting. I I did expect him to be among that group that, that got paid to that level. But uh, yeah, just uh, interesting that nobody is doing it. So I, well, I suppose if the price comes down enough. Does he end up a Seahawk again? I, I feel like they could be done on the offensive line though. Yeah. It, you know, you, may, you mentioned draft. the left guard spot and I think that that's going to be a spot that Finney competes for. That's going to be a spot that Jamarco Jones can compete for yeah. uh, a spot for Phil Haynes. You know, you have three yeah. guys now who are able to compete for that spot. Let alone whoever they draft, right? Right. Okay, and, fair enough. And you have a boy he who can play both tackle positions and can and also played some snaps at tight end for Jacksonville. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah. All right, there we go. Did he catch a pass like George Fant? Though? I no, I think I think Fant might be leading in that department. I, I'm not sure, <laughs> okay. but I mean Gary Gilliam caught a pass for the Seahawks too, so. True fact. True fact. I think that about rounds out the news. We have the restricted free agents for the Seahawks that mm-hmm. uh, that they decided to offer tenders to. Uh, Malik Turner. Oh, those are uh, exclusive rights free agents. Uh, Malik mm. Turner, Brian Monet, Jordan Roos, Ryan Neal. The uh, tendered restricted free agents were David Moore, Jacob Hollister, Joey Hunt, and Brandon Jackson. Everybody get an original round tender, which is about a $2 million contract except for Jacob Hollister, who gets a second round tender, which is upwards of $3 million. Yeah, and that makes sense in terms of his production throughout the year. 
there would be a team that if you did original round tender would come and swoop them up. So that's that's just protecting your butt there. But there nobody's I mean, giving up a Louise, second round pick to to pay them though. I mean, is John Schneider treating the tight end position a little like, you know, those uh promotions that say like Arby's where they're giving out like different themed Star Wars cups, <laughs> you know, where you got to collect them all? Cuz that's how it feels. Holy smokes, is there a tight end we're not going to sign other than Jimmy Graham? Uh, Jordan Reed uh, brought in to apparently they haven't signed him yet, but yeah. a guy who they're taking a look at, at the, and it feels like, OK, Luke Wilson was re-signed by the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. So Techno Thursday, apparently back. Uh, I know you're super happy about that. <laughs> Boo. But four tight ends on the roster already with Greg Olson. And I guess maybe it's a signal that uh, Montana will is not going to be ready for week one. So that's a little bit of a bummer. Oh, I don't know that that signals anything you like might, that. It might signal that, Adam. It maybe possibly kind of sort of might. <laughs> sure. Jeez if Louise. we get to make up news in this offseason of right, what's likely going to be very little news, I'm going to say right now, put me on the record, Uncle Will probably going to be on PUP to start the season. Well, I don't like that news that you made up. <laughs> I don't like it either. Okay, then don't make it up. I suppose that's true. I should not make up that news. You know, do you want to talk a little bit about some of our division rivals and what's going on with them in free agency for a minute? I, I do a little bit. Oh, Although, okay, I, let's let's knock out one other one. Although I okay. do want to talk about this too a little bit more on the back end. Uh, you did bring up Bruce Irvin coming back to the Seahawks. That's uh, Oh, God, how did we not talk about that more? I, I know. We, we kind of glossed over it. You just threw it in there among the things that you'd like to see, and then you never even brought up you know, how much you like this move. Yeah, I didn't, because he's a guy that really came out and performed fairly well last year for the Panthers. I mean, eight plus, or what, eight and a half sacks? Is that where he ended up? Was he up eight. that high? It was eight. It was at least eight. Wow. Yeah, so a guy who can still produce. You know how many eight is? Twice as many as our leading sacker last year in green. Yeah. So that's a that's actually a significant upgrade. Yeah. Plus, Eight and a half even. Yeah, there you, you go. You got to give, give Bruce his full credit. Give him that extra half. Yeah, I couldn't remember, so I was trying. But yeah, that was, I think that was a sneaky signing. And really, it's cool to have Bruce back. I love bringing back these guys. I mean, geez, Louise, at this point, you know, if you can get Mike B on the cheap, come back and be a rotational player, cool. Uh, the defensive tackle that I actually think would be a freaking steal because there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in him, but I think can still play is Mike Daniels from the Green Bay Packers. Yes. Yeah. I would be really stoked to see that signing along with Clowney or Everson Griffin, one of those guys. Yeah, because you brought up your frustration with this. You know, of all the deals that the Seahawks weren't involved in, the Jarrell Casey for good lord seventh round pick <laughs> john schneider couldn't give up a sixth round pick for jarell casey that's what i'm saying like did he not even get a call because th- the other thought was well is he demanding a huge contract like what's going on nope nope just 11 million a year for the next two years yeah for a guy who is a top 100 player that was a little weird the yeah. deandre hopkins thing okay I can understand that from the sense of, you know, and then the what? Texans. How? Are what? you defending the Texans yet again? No, no, no. I'm, I'm defending the Seahawks not being in on the deal because they're not going to pay DeAndre Hopkins 18 to 20 million dollars a year at wide receiver. Exactly. That part. That part makes sense. But no, there's no defending Bill O'Brien, <laughs> much like there was no defending Jesus. Bill O'Brien with the clowny deal. Yeah, Th- this was a moronic move. I mean, good for the Cardinals to be the one on the other end of the phone with him and, and get this deal done. I'm wondering if mm. John Schneider needs to be on the phone, you know, trying to get J.J. Watt for a fifth round pick. But, you know, gosh, for one, to get David Johnson off your books, a guy who was a cap hit of 16 million dollars for the Arizona Cardinals this year to even find a trade partner willing to take him on. And so essentially you get a fourth round pick. For David Johnson, which seems if you and $16 million in cap relief for a fourth round pick. Meanwhile, Jarrell Casey is going to the Broncos for a seventh round pick. So Bill O'Brien, that makes no sense. And then to get a second round pick for DeAndre Hopkins, the probably the top one or two guys in the entire NFL 
you can make an argument he's top three to four, right? Like depending, like Easy. okay, one whatever, to four. whatever you want to rank, whatever it. order. But he's one of the guys, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael Thomas, him. He's one of the guys. Yep. And the Texans only get a second rounder. Yeah, okay. He wants eighteen to twenty million dollars. No freaking duh. He's one of those top four guys. You pay the best guys. Absolutely. And so that's a no brainer for the Arizona Cardinals to bring him on and pay him Julio Jones money. Okay. Yeah, and especially not a, not like he's 35 years old at this point. No, no. He's still a youngish guy. And you and- see Minnesota trade Stephon Diggs to the yeah. Bills and get a boatload of picks? I mean, if I were a Texans fan, I'd be livid. Oh, my God. I, I would... I'm not a fan of fans burning things, <laughs> right, of, of their team. But at this point, like, Bill O'Brien would make me want to burn down the facility. Like, for real. Yeah. I mean, call, basically calls him a thug, DeAndre Hopkins, says he's got to get rid of him, while DeAndre Hopkins has been nothing but a model citizen in terms of things with the law, right? Oh, yeah. You may not like that he has children with a couple different chicks. Yeah. Like, But is that a reason why your GM should be getting rid of guys? No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's just crazy town to me. Every other, I heard this from, I want to say it was either Mike Florio or, you know, some other uh, talking head, but their point was, is these top like three, four, five receivers in the league, everyone gets a first round pick for them. Everyone. Brandon Cooks got it twice and he's not a top five guy. No. So to only get a second and then, and then take on the corpse that is David Johnson and that ridiculous contract. Like, that is just as bad as it gets. It's like, do you remember when the Texans got rid of Brock Osweiler and they had to give up a second round pick to get them to take that crap contract? Yeah. This is the running back equivalent of that. They should have had to give up David Johnson and a second round pick just to get him off the books. Well, they did. But they shouldn't have gotten a DeAndre Hopkins back no, <laughs> for that. No. <laughs> yeah. I just unfreaking believable. But as far as how that affects the Cardinals, I mean, great ad, no doubt about it. And people are all jacked up. That's great. But I'm going to tell you, Nuke is going to get tired of running five yard outs. It's going to bore the hell out of him. I mean, it, it's just, I don't see, I mean, his real big skill set is a down the field threat and that's not Kyler's game. That's not Cliff Kingsbury's offense. So I'm not sure he's an amazing fit there. I think this is going to look a lot more like OBJ to the Browns than I'm trying to think of another, like a TO that went from uh, the Niners to, or from Dallas to the Eagles or whichever way it went. Yeah. I can't remember his course. Yeah. Niners, Eagles, <laughs> Dallas. That's how it went. So when TO went from the Niners to the Eagles, that was a big deal and it made a big difference in their offense. Whereas, you know, with the Browns, OBJ gets traded there, and the team still withers and dies. Um, I'm going with withers and dies for the stupid Cardinals. I do think that this is a good move for the Cardinals, though. I, I Even if he is running five yards out, he's a guy that can make guys miss. He's a great guy to just throw his direction on third down. And Hopkins is also a guy that's, you're, you're talking to me, like, I mean, Hopkins has been a guy that I've, has been one of my favorite receivers like Larry Fitzgerald. And it it just pains me the fact that now they're both on the same team together. But he is just a guy that makes quarterbacks that he's played with look better. And you Mm -hmm. have to remember, I mean, Deshaun Watson, he he doesn't need that much help looking better. He's already a good quarterback. But look at all the quarterbacks that were with the Texans before throwing Hopkins direction. And he was still having great seasons. So to me, he's more of the Isaac Bruce type mold with the Rams who had so many years of making guys like Tony Banks look good before Kurt Warner eventually came around and was throwing him the football toward the end of his career. So it's, I I look at him in that way. Well, that's great. But did Deandre Hopkins upgrade the guy throwing passes to him or downgrade? Oh, he downgraded, but I don't think, I I still don't think it matters. It matters to a degree. Uh, Sure. Plus, I want to crap on the Cardinals a little bit. I, so. I understand. And really, yeah. they, they, they're they going to have to get better on the offensive line. If, but, oh. but if they do get better on the offensive line, look out. Oh, it's hard to get better on the offensive line and have money to do that when you trade for a receiver before you address offensive line and then give them a giant contract. And then 
This was my favorite move by the Cardinals all free agency so far. Franchising Kenyon Drake so that you have to pay him a top five salary for a guy that you could have gotten at, you could have re-signed at mid-tier money. Who's paying Kenyon Drake top five money? No, nobody. And it wasn't the franchise, though. It was the transition tag. So it was, I think, what's that, top 15 rather than top five? Uh, great. Yeah, it was still upwards of eight million, eight and a half million dollars. Nobody's giving him that kind of money. No. I mean, geez, Louise, even the Dolphins didn't want him. No. So they're paying their running back almost $10 million. They're paying their aging wide receiver, Larry Fitzgerald, $11 million. I mean, they can afford to do some of this because of the fact that Kyler Murray is on his rookie deal. And that's that's cool and all, but we'll see how that all buffs out. I don't think it's going to buff out great. They haven't done anything on defense, and that's the side of the ball they need far more help on. But we'll see. That's the team I worry about the least. Let's talk about the, ter- the team that maybe we worry about the most these days. That'd be the San Francisco how Winers. Can you say, how can you say that the Cardinals did nothing on defense? They got Jordan Phillips, three years, $30 million. They got Devon Kennard, three years, $20 million to play linebacker. Was that the end of the list? <laughs> that was the end of the list. <laughs> okay. All right. Because I, I almost recognize Kennard's name from Detroit, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think so. I think that's where he came from. But Yeah, he, he, yeah. he, yeah, he was from Detroit. Yeah, not no and, big and moves before there. that. I think he was drafted by the Jets before that. Or not the Jets, the Giants. Okay, fair enough. But, yeah, not a lot going on there. Jordan Phillips, where was he at? Your mom's house? He, I don't know. He was Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, he played uh, Bills and uh, Miami. Oh, okay. Trader. But, yeah, not guys that jump out at you and guys that they're paying $10 million a year in Phillips' case and you know, nearly that, uh, around $7 million a year for uh, the outside linebacker. Speaking of guys that are worth the money, though, that that guy to me would be like DeForest Buckner for the Niners. Yeah. And yet they paid somebody who I don't believe is worth the money in Armstead and traded Buckner to the Colts. They got the 13th overall pick, though. Oh, is that what they ended up with in return? I guess I never saw. Yeah, for they got the number thir- the first round uh, pick from the Colts, which was the number 13 overall for Buckner. So that's a pretty good return on a trade. Yeah, that is. All right. I wanted to crush him on this. <laughs> but Armstead, you know, that could end up backfiring on him, too. Oh, for sure. I think that's a terrible signing. I understand it, though. If you're going to try and keep one of them, you can't necessarily. I mean, you could let both of them go. And I think they probably could have gotten equal production from a defensive tackle spot for guys who are getting paid uh, in that range. Or I guess he's a he's a three, four defensive end Armstead, right? Yeah. But, a lanky one. I don't know. I just I don't get Armstead's game. It's it seems a lot to give up, but I don't hate the DeForest Buckner deal. No, I didn't realize that that's what they got back was the the thirteenth pick. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. That's fine. <laughs> well, whatever. The Niners haven't really done much else in free agency to this point because they're they're pretty much you know at the edge of their salary cap. Yeah, they they kept Jimmy Ward, right? Not not uh, a lot they can do now. The Rams, on the other hand, now, I was going to we... say, do you want to? You want to? Uh, like, this is a little like comparing Italy to the U.S. right now with the virus thing, right? And they're like, if you want to know how it's going to be in two weeks, just look at Italy now because we're two weeks behind them. <laughs> this is how the Rams and the Niners kind of work. If you want to know what the uh, Niners are going to look like in about two years, uh-huh. just take a look at the Rams right now. With in the best part about this to me are the lies that are coming out of LA about the idea that they're going to trade Todd Gurley. No way that happens because Bill O'Brien already traded for a a crap back out of the NFC West. Uh That's overpaid. There is nobody else who in the hell would give up anything for a guy with a bad knee. That's making a good trillion dollars. Nobody, nobody. And he's not going to restructure. He's already said it. That's why the Rams are trying to ditch him. Yeah, why would you restructure? If I'm talking early, there's no way. Because I'm not getting another contract. I would restructure, I guess, if it meant more guaranteed money. I guess, but, yeah. I mean, that, that That's doesn't not make why s- you would restructure if you're the team, right? Like, <laughs> right. you're not doing that. No, you want to make it so you can cut him and not have to pay him as much. <laughs> exactly. So, no, I don't blame him. I mean, his body got wore down real quick. And... 
I'd hold on to every dollar I could get out of that contract. No doubt about it. But there's nobody. Nobody is trading for Todd Gurley. Nobody's trading for Todd Gurley. And Thursday, March 19, 2020 marks a great day as well on the calendar for the Rams because it is the day that Jared Goff gets a $21 million roster bonus paid while another $43 million of future salary and bonuses becomes guaranteed. Jared Goff now has a $94 million dead cap figure for the Rams as of 2020. Wow, man. Like, I can't believe they didn't just jettison Goff just to try to save the future cap hell that that puts on them. Holy smokes. Jared Goff, in terms of cap hits, is ranked number one in the entire NFL. $36 million for 2020, $5 million more than Russell Wilson. But the interesting <laughs> thing is, uh, three of your top five quarterbacks and cap money for 2020 mm -hmm. come from the NFC West. Really? Yeah. Goff is number one, Garoppolo's number five, and Russell Wilson's number four. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize Garoppolo's contract on the back half had that big of a cap hit. I think in 2019, he actually had a relatively low cap hit, yeah. and then it jumps up this one, and then I think it kind of tails off the next couple of years. I see. Niners staying put with him. They could have had Brady, sounds like. Sure. Gotten a third rounder for Garoppolo. And... Or who knows? It may be even better. I mean, Foles, the Bears got, gave up a fourth rounder for Foles. He's won a Super Bowl. <laughs> that's true <laughs> so there's that yeah okay so maybe a third is generous i i think a third is right what he's worth yeah very mediocre and terrible under pressure i mean would you give up more than a third for andy dalton who can actually run but has the same problems as garoppolo dalton probably gets a fourth or a fifth right oh max yeah yeah I'd give up like a six for Dalton. Yeah, the two other quarterbacks in that top five for uh, uh, cap hit rankings, Ben Roethlisberger, number two, yeah. 33.5 million. Dak Prescott at three with 31.5. I, I think that's smart by the Cowboys, though, what they're doing with Dak. They're basically doing the Kirk Cousins move with the Redskins, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what you do with Dak. I don't think he's one of the top five guys, and I don't know that he's ever going to be. Uh, he's a good, he's a good to very good quarterback, but he's not one of the top five guys. And I think that's what these execs are starting to realize is that, yes, you pay quarterbacks money, of course. But if he's not one of the top five dudes, then you just move on and you find yet another, you know, pretty good quarterback. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not that hard to do. I mean, you got to pay the right quarterback. That's the danger in the, the big quarterback money game. So could the Cowboys be in the quarterback draft market this year? I'd be looking. But, I mean, I haven't gone deep dive yet at all. But so far, the little bit I've looked into this quarterback draft class, not stoked about it. Yeah, and by the time you get down to number 17 where the Cowboys are. Yeah. Well, who knows? A lot can happen between now and then. Yeah. But the Cowboys do That's get to keep now Dak and Amari Cooper. And Zeke Elliott. So they did it. Oh, and they got Gerald McCoy. Oh, okay. Which I'm kind of bummed about. I, I don't think Gerald McCoy is a Northwest guy, though. No, it didn't seem like it. And I think that's more money than I'd want to give Gerald McCoy at this point in his career. Um, Clayus Campbell was the other that. tough move that uh, you wonder why the Seahawks couldn't have got in on that. Yeah, that, that one and the Casey move were the two tough ones. Um, but I did want to get back to the Rams a little bit. And just kind of where no, you're things not are done going with crapping them. on the Rams. No, <laughs> no. I mean, think about all the pieces that they're losing on defense this year. Uh, mediocre Eric Weddle retires. Littleton's gone. Dante Fowler Jr. is gone. Did Brockers leave yet? Yeah, didn't he go? He didn't he get one of those three year, $10 million deals? Seems like it. I don't know. I was looking for the the article that had all like listed all the dudes. That they're losing on defense. Oh, yeah. Brockers went to the Ravens, too. Oh, that's a good move for them. God, Ravens doing good stuff. Yeah, their defensive line is going to be stacked. And plus, they franchise Judon. Yeah. They're paying a lot of money. How much How much money do the Ravens have tied up in their defensive line? Holy smokes. I don't know. But I'm 
sure it's the majority of the cap. And again, Lamar Jackson on a rookie contract. So yeah, but they're having to jet. They had uh, the retirement of their their one good guard, right? Uh, Yonda. Is he still playing? No, no, he retired this off season. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what I thought. And then they had other guys that they had to cut because they're they're getting up there in salary cap. So I think they're going to have a hard time protecting Lamar Jackson this upcoming year. Yeah, he can run enough. That's oh, true. Rams also losing uh, Roby Coleman, the nickel spot. Oh, right. Oh, uh, not to mention uh, Wade Phillips. They, they did uh, let Wade Phillips go. Yeah. They're not going to be a good team next year. They gave a three-year contract. To Andrew Whitworth. To Whitworth? To that's and- got to be a that's got to be a thanks for not retiring, bud. Contract. <laughs> that's a, so you can you can uh, spread out the cap hit over three years when he retires after this year, I guess. Yeah, that's got to be the way that works, right? It has to be, because the dude is thirty eight years old. <laughs> yeah. Offensive tackles do not play into their forties. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And he had a serious amount of decline last year. I guess they redid sign, uh, or they re signed uh, Austin Blythe. Who? Who? Yeah, he was an offensive lineman. He's okay. They're talking about having to trade Brandon Cooks. That'd be fine. He didn't do diddly squat last year, anyways. They're not going to, nobody's given up a first round pick for Brandon Cooks anymore. But they don't have any draft picks because they traded them all away for the right to overpay Jalen Ramsey. And, they're, and they still haven't done that yet. <laughs> right. The Rams are in tough shape, man. It's going to be a rough year for them. Uh, that's exciting to see. Uh, I think uh, the Niners coming off that brutal Super Bowl loss. And I think guys like Buckner are a big deal when you lose that. Jimmy Garoppolo is going to take a step back because he's just going to be shamed for the whole year. Yeah, I, I don't know. The one signing they did make is they signed Ashawn Robinson, defensive tackle for two years, 17 million. Nifty Frito, which is a he's a he's a dude. He's the type of dude that the Seahawks wait in free agency for and sign a dude that gives you similar production, although he's, you know, they go for a guy that's 33 rather than 24 and they pay three million dollars for rather than eight point five million for. Sure. Uh, they also brought in uh, your offseason heartthrob, Leonard Floyd. I had about six hours for him to be an off-season heartthrob, Adam. Well, you you went. It was maybe it was just a quick crush, but uh, it was there. I saw it. Yeah, and they overpaid for him too. I'm not sad to see him go to the Rams when he's getting ten million a year. Well, so I think I told you when you said that you were interested in this guy that I'm overtaking big risks on first round flameouts. Uh huh. Uh, so congratulations to the Rams for doing exactly that. That's great. Well, the thing is, is that he was set to make, I think, uh, between 10 and $13 million from the Bears this year. They cut him. And usually Mm -hmm. when you get cut, you make a a pretty decent chunk less than what you were going to make with your previous team. You don't go and sign for just about the exact same amount somewhere else. You know, that's why people trade for guys. Exactly. So when I saw that he was cut and not traded for, I thought, okay, well. Maybe the, the Hawks could get him for around, you know, seven, eight million. You're, and have a guy that can actually produce in the run game where and, and maybe have some sort of pass rush instead of a guy like Ziggy Anza. No, I mean, you, you speak the truth there and there's no doubt. But my two favorite general managers in my in my division are if I'm going to rank them in order of my favorite general managers in the NFC West, I think it's got to be Steve Kime, number one. Les Snead, number two, John Schneider, number three, and John Lynch, number four, because Keim and Snead do the dumbest crap, man. They do. And I love it. It's great. It's really good for our deal. Definitely not as much of a fan as the 49ers GM. He seems to do smart things. Yeah, which I knew he would when they freaking hired him. Stinks. You know, one other contract that really did in the NFL that struck me odd was Tannehill's. Oh, yeah. Like, what in... What in the good catfish are you doing? He was good for half a season in Miami once upon a time, and then half a season in Tennessee. And that's what you do? And he made like seven throws. I don't get it. I don't get it. They want to make another run, but yeah, you lose a guy like Jarrell Casey. You lose your... 
Oh, that was the other spot that, uh, you know, I was a little bit bummed that the Seahawks were in on the Jack Conklin deal. Like he didn't get all that much to go to the Browns. Yeah. I Again, I don't know that that's where we need to spend a lot of money on. I think we did exactly what we needed to do on the offensive line so far. Sure. I, I really like John's approach there, you know, committing resources, but not committing huge resources there. Whereas because Russell Wilson can mask a lot of that. Whereas on the defensive line, Russell Wilson can't mask that. <laughs> so, you know, spend a lot more money there. Yeah. And yeah, I like the way that's kind of shaping up, but I don't understand. I somehow Tannehill has seven good games for the Titans. And I don't know how many actually played, but something like that. Right. And all of a sudden everybody's like, Oh yeah, no, Ryan Tannehill. He's good. I, I always thought he was good. Just had a bad shake in Miami. There are those guys though. That have you know, have the struggles in a bad spot. He's not then, Rich Gannon. And then they develop a little bit. He's not Rich Gannon. Not Rich Gannon, not Alex Smith? No. Oh, okay. No, he's still Ryan Tannehill. I mean, I, th I think that's what you're hoping for, giving him a salary like they did. Four years, yeah. $118 million. <laughs> wow. $91 million guaranteed. That's insane. That's really high. That's insane. Okay, you sold me on this. <laughs> it shouldn't have been hard. I didn't pay that much attention to it, honestly. I thought, oh, Ryan Tannehill got paid. <laughs> and that's about as much thought as I gave it. <laughs> oh, okay. Because you you, uh, you gave it uh, two words, too few thought. You know, oh, Ryan Tannehill got paid. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. two words, too yeah, few. I, I just, I, I didn't take it out, those, those extra two words. <laughs> yeah, that's it. All right, Adam. Well, what do you say we take a break, we come back, we talk a little bit more of news around the NFL and get to some do better, better at life. Welcome some new members of the flock. Hey, all right. Sounds like a plan. And we are back getting into the second half of the show. There's still some stuff to talk about around the NFL, Adam. Yeah, man. Play the breaking news sounder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe Flacco cut by the Denver Broncos. Oh, my stars. What, what's going to happen to the NFL now? This is going to shake up everything. With Cam Newton still out there, with Jameis Winston still out there, and Joe Flacco. There's your your big three of guys who <laughs> could change the landscape of the NFL. Yeah, it's interesting. The quarterback carousel this year, obviously. I mean, with Phillip Rivers looking like he's going to the Colts, Tom Brady to the the Bucks, uh, the Chargers being like, yeah, we don't need none, none of y'all. We're going to go with uh, T squared. And I, I think that's good for them. Uh, I like Tyrod Taylor yeah, for, for them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think the most interesting place now has to be New England when it comes to the quarterback position. And I'm telling you, man, this is what's going to happen. Bill Belichick is going to give up like a sixth round draft pick for Cam Newton. And revive him for like two years. Probably. It's the most Belichickian move like ever. You get out from underneath Tom Brady a year before his arm totally falls off. Right. And then just like he does with all of his great players, he always gets out a year or two early. And then he finds some guy that he totally has to either underpay or has to give up very little to get and gets tremendous value, and then makes him back into a star. Or at least gets as big a production out of him as anybody ever has. I mean, Jameis kind of falls into that category for no. me, too. I no. think he could. No. If, of, of things that no. are Belichickian. But no, fa fa fast forward to week three, when Jameis throws his seventh interception on the year. Can you imagine Bill's head exploding? Uh, it would be unbelievable. He would freaking... Just die inside. And then when Jameis comes trotting off the field, can you imagine the tirade? Yeah, I, oh, I'd like man. to see that. But I I wonder if he doesn't find a way to you know just make Jameis throw more of those shorter, high percentage throws rather than going for kill shots. Having paired Bruce Arians with Jameis Winston is like the worst thing that can ha happen for the development of Jameis Winston. Okay, let me ask you a quick question. Did Jameis Winston throw a crap ton of interceptions in college? Yeah. Did he throw a crap ton <laughs> of interceptions for his first coach with the Bucks? Sure. Did he throw a crap ton of interceptions for Cutter, his next head coach? Yeah. 
Oh, how about uh, Bruce Arians? He throw a crap ton of interceptions for him. Uh, I think the crappiest most ton of interceptions. Yes, the the largest crap ton of interceptions was for Arians. This isn't getting better. Uh, no. This is who he is. No, I suppose. I think I think Mariota getting signed with the Raiders is actually a fairly interesting signing. That one's interesting. That makes sense to me. I mean, it seems to be that Mariota's downfall of a quarterback as a quarterback is a lack of creativity. Like that's not what he does. He's got to have things in a system that is a lot like the Niners played back in the Bill Walsh days. You know, your feet tell you where to throw the ball. You know, after three steps, it's this guy. After five steps, it's that guy. It needs to be mathematical. And that is John Gruden in John Gruden's offense. I think I think Mariota could do some things there. I really do. That one is an interesting move to me for the Raiders. They wanted Mariota instead of Winston. Think about that for a second. Sure. I don't know. It just seems like for something to work out for Belichick, that just seems like one of those things that would work out. Although Winston going to the Patriots, I mean, who do you have to throw to with the Patriots now? Well, that's why you bring in Cam. I mean, Brady didn't have Because he anybody. runs around, and, and Belichick is tired of doing statue quarterback things. Yeah, I could see that. He he wants to get with the, the program, with the, yes. the new wave here. Exactly. Cam he was an MVP one year. And you're talking him or Winston? <laughs> like, for reals? Okay, fine. I'm just, that's my prediction. I think Cam will be a patriot. Or he gets the red rifle from, from the Bengals. Yeah, and I think that's a backup plan. I, maybe the only reason Cam wouldn't go to New England is personality-wise, he's not a fit there. Yeah. Like, why is he still, why is he still, like, texting out things in, like, some crazy alien font? Like, what is that about? <laughs> like, that's some crackhead stuff. Like, why? You're a grown-ass man. What are you doing? I, I want to try and break the code on what Yannick Ngakwe is doing because he's tweeting out like a li- just a single emoji every single day. And and I feel like it, there's got to be some kind of code to it, some kind of cryptic uh, nature that we have to crack this somehow. Well, OK, now that is interesting. And we had uh, Flocktimus Prime, Keith Ketover, you mm-hmm. know, put up the what was it? Was it Instagram or was it a tweet? Picture. It was Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So from Ngakwe's uh, Instagram, and it was a picture of what looked to me to be every airport everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was it, the in the in the foreground. It was the airport chairs at every right. airport. Right. You know, those chairs aren't unique to to, to any airport in particular. The carpet With- maybe maybe unique. I don't know. It looks like airport carpet. But apparently somebody in the background could see that it was one of the terminals in SeaTac. So, yeah, Ring of Honor member Jake Berdine said that that was the terminal that's through the windows Yeah, was the <laughs> north terminal for SeaTac. I don't know, man. But I guess one way you could kind of narrow it down a little bit, I can say for certain that some of the tail rudders on the planes that are taxiing around in the photo um, are American Airlines. So if you find where American Airlines actually has roots to, Mm -hmm. that narrows it down a little bit. Yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah, we're going to see. It sounds like there's a a few teams in the running to maybe trade for Ngakwe. So I I just wonder if that, again, I wonder if that's in pairing with Clowney or a backup plan to Clowney. It's hard telling not knowing at this point, right? Hey, the, uh, the Cardinals... Here they are spending more money on linebackers, eight and a half million for Devondre Campbell from uh, who was formerly with the Falcons. They had a defensive player on the Falcons team last year. Apparently, <laughs> I wasn't aware. Hey, speaking of guys that were on the Falcons, Vic Beasley still out there? No, he's not. He signed somewhere. No, did he? Ah, uh, where did he sign? Oh, give me a second. It'll come to me. Crap, it's not going to come to me. <laughs> you said it was going to come to you. Yeah. Oh, good. he went to the Titans. There we go. Okay. How about how about the Browns making the most Brown signing ever and overpaying for Austin Hooper? They did get Jack Conklin though, on a pretty decent deal. That's fine. That Austin Hooper signing is stupid. Yeah, I saw Pro Football Focus was ranking the worst moves. Austin hmm. Hooper was up there. Uh, George Fant was up there among the worst moves. <laughs> And so when I saw those two together, it kind of made sense to me. 
Yeah. Those are bad moves by bad teams. Well, the Hopkins move. Oh, by the Texans. That's got to be number yeah. one, right? Yeah. I think these were actual signings, though. So I, I don't think. Oh, okay. Just think, bad signings. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that was among the among that particular list. Gotcha. Man, we're going to have an extra long list season this year, and it's going to be for all sports. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to be creative this year. We're going to create content in news going forward so that we can all be entertained. You mean we can't just crap on everybody's lists all off season? I mean, we can do that for a while. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in, but I don't know. I'm not struggling with this staying at home thing. Like oh, this no. is, this is totally in my wheelhouse. <laughs> and yeah. apparently it's in the wheelhouse of our entire, entire generation, Brandon generation X. I didn't know. This. Oh really? Yeah. I, I saw a couple articles posted today that uh, apparently our generation is are, are referred to as latchkey kids, which I don't exactly understand what that means. Huh. But the, I guess the idea is is that we were kind of the last generation where, or really the generation where both parents were now going to work to make oh. the bills. You know, we can kind of entertain ourselves. We we know how to and, do this, and we had to like entertain ourselves. And there's some there's some funny freaking tweets about it. There's no doubt about it because we grew up without the internet. Like kids these days, like they can just sit around on YouTube, and that's. A, but I, we we are multi dimensional in the ways that we can entertain ourselves. So I did find a, I pulled up a couple of these, uh, you know, tweets or Instagram posts or things like that by people. And mm -hmm. uh, one of these, there, there, a couple of them are pretty funny. This is like, glad I'm a Gen X kid. I'm using my skills I picked up as a latchkey kid, making toaster oven snacks, chilling on the couch. Now, if I can find some episodes of Gilligan's Island, Bewitched, and I Dream of Genie, I'm set. That resonates with me. Yeah. Oh, here's something about your, uh, your no internet thing. I, I'm part of Gen X generation where we had no internet. We had the Dewey Decimal System, libraries, comics, books, biking, swimming, exploring the great outdoors, camping, fishing, and so many things that today's generation knows nothing about. You know, I'm glad that we're in an area, though, where we go outside and we're not around people. Like, for people, that must be really hard, especially for people in an you know, area like Seattle, where yeah. the, the goal is to try and not be around people. You can't really go outside to get away from people. It, it That's the thing is... That's what's great about here. People are like, you got to, you know, isolate. Well, that's basically what we do every day here in Montana. It's not like you run into a lot of people. No. I mean, this is, in a way, if you take all of the negative side effects, whether that's economic or like people dying, getting sick, that sort of thing, the positives, the net positives of this for me are like a dream. Yes, please give me an excuse to go and hang out at my cabin for two months and, and just totally isolate from the world. No, no problem. Done and done. I got one more of these little dealies that I, this was the funniest one to me. Okay, let's hear it. All right. The life of a Gen X kid. Wake up and immediately go outside, play with dangerous things in dangerous places. Show up for dinner 14 hours later. Parents are surprised to learn you weren't home. Eat fish sticks alone while watching TV. Read in bed with a flashlight. <laughs> that, that, that basically describes my childhood right there. Except for fish sticks. It's, it, we're... You, just uh, replace that with pizza bites from the Schwanz guy, <laughs> and you got it. Oh, man. No, that takes me back to my childhood for sure. I, there were days where I would go just out in the woods with friends, Yeah, and we would be so far away from home. I don't think my parents had any idea just how far away like from home we would wander and make it back later in the day. And for parents of kids now... You know, how often do they go farther than a few blocks away from the house at any given time? That seems that seems a little bit weird. It's totally different. Like, I can remember specifically multiple, multiple occasions getting yelled at for being in the house. Get outside. <laughs> get out of the house. Go away. Like, basically just told to leave for hours on end. What yeah. are you guys going to do? I don't know. We're going to go to the river. And we, like you said, wander a long ways away. I mean, our range was probably a good two mile radius. Yeah. Like in any direction in, at any given time. <laughs> like that's Which what is we a were pretty doing. big range. Yes. I think about that with my kid now. And like, she's 16 even at this point. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I mean, going across town, like that's a long ways away. Like, it's just totally different. It is. We were free range kids. See, this is the kind of off season content. I think that, uh, that we're just going to be putting out no matter what. It's what, <laughs> it's what we're here for people. 
People seem to appreciate it, though. I guess. Yeah, we got some new members of the flock. Jeffrey Brelsford in at $3 a month. So welcome to the flock to Jeffrey. Heck yeah, man. Appreciate it, dude. And Aaron Fisher in at $5 a month. So welcome to the flock to Aaron. That's amazing. All right. In a time where, uh, you know, people are hoarding, these guys are givers. I like it. Getintheflock.com. And uh, you can help support the show through the off season. Hey, I got a I got a recruiting tool slash promotional piece here to, oh, to okay. give. Yeah, as far as getting more people into the flock. Yeah. If we can get to 5,000 members of the flock mm. by, in the next week, <laughs> then I promise that I will give every single American or every single adult in America $1,000 a month and every kid $500 a month for the next two months. That is very generous. Yeah. It's not going to come directly from you, though, right? It's going to come from somewhere. I'm just saying it's going to show up. <laughs> if, if, and only if, you get in the flock right now and we get up to 5,000 members. Get in the flock. in the flock.com. That sounds like, you know, you're not just helping Adam and I. Right? We're helping the entire United States. You know, every show we put out, Brandon, we're helping the entire United States. It's what we're here for. I can't wait to be back here. You know what? As soon as we aren't even going to wait the full week, we yeah. once we get to 5,000 members of the flock, we'll be mm -hmm. right. We'll be on the show. Yeah. Talking we'll about be, it. Yep. We'll get right on the mic and then uh, we'll start uh, generating checks. And it might take a month or so. It might be April before you start seeing that come in the mail. But, uh, you know, it's our intention to get that out. Oh, see, I was thinking about a promotion where I, I start ramping up the production of at my uh, brother and sister-in-law's coffee business. Okay. Because, uh, you know, with the, uh, we did the full calf, mint calf, uh, you know, illegally, uh, yeah. but not illegally. Right. I'm glad to see you still not in jail. That's nice. Yeah. And the, the My Morning Hakra. I think we can still do that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was kind of thinking, you know, people who get in the flock, you know, it'd have to, we'd have to come up with a certain level for it, though. Does coffee cost money to send out? It does. Yeah. You're assuming that we'll have mail people to, like, take it around to people. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the mail will still go out. <laughs> That's a, you have a very high opinion of the apocalypse, Greg. <laughs> okay. It, it'll get out eventually. Okay. Maybe, see, <laughs> right. maybe I need to think through some of these deals. I like your idea better. Yeah. yeah. $1,000 to every household. Straight cash, homie. The Randy Moss promotion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. There you go. That's where Andrew Yang screwed up. He called it what? Uh, mandatory. What? What was the? What's the acronym that he used for sending the U people? UBI. Thousand? Universal yeah. Basic Income. No, no. It's a, it's a SCH. Straight, Straight cash, cash, homie. homie. <laughs> yeah. He could have got Randy Moss to promote it. That would have made him rise in the polls. Yeah. It's about marketing. He just screwed that part. He, he screwed it up. Well, now now his idea might actually go into effect and. And we won't have to complain about it being socialism. It'll just be the way things are. <laughs> it's funny how things get uh, uh, painted in a different light, uh, depending on who makes the suggestion. <laughs> I'm going to give everybody $1,000 a month, says Andrew Lang. You're a socialist. <laughs> Trump comes out and is like, yes, I'd like to give everybody $1,000 a month. It's going to be amazing. Tremendous. Yay, America. <laughs> Capitalism at its best. <laughs> just It just matters. It just depends on the filter. You know this. I know. It's funny. It's just, it's just am amusing to me. It's a good time to be an independent. <laughs> it is a good time to be an independent. And a Gen Xer. You're looking at the millennials who don't take this crap seriously. Like, I don't know if you're having a problem, like, getting your parents to take this crap seriously. But, like, my dad's just like, oh, no, it's fine. Don't No big deal. I'm still going to Washington. I'm going to do a bunch of jobs. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, but it, he would have until they actually canceled on him. Right. Oh no, like that's girlfriend's yeah. mom. Yeah. Yeah. Zero craps given. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to the store. I'll be fine. My daughter, <laughs> you know, uh, you, the, one of those Gen Zers or Homelanders, millennial. Yeah, whatever they are. Yeah. I don't understand why I'll have to stay at home. And she's just livid pissed that she can't go and hang out with her friends. Uh huh. Well, all us Gen Xers are like, just stay the catfish home for a little while, okay? It's <laughs> this not is a big what deal. we're doing now. Deal yeah. with it, and we'll get through this as quickly as possible. Good God. <laughs> I don't know. Have you had that problem? I yes. Uh, although not on the other end, because my my oldest just turned twelve. No. So. But are you having problems with, with your mom to stay home? Uh, mom, not so much. But definitely on on uh, you know my my father in law. Side? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
because he's he's well he's like a social butterfly anyway so oh i see yeah okay so it's tough for him yeah it's not tough it's not tough just stay home eat snacks yeah skype someone if you're lonely I know that he and they got 20 acres he could go out and bump around on. I, I don't see why. Why not just do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got my my goal for this weekend is to get as much materials up to the cabin site as possible in terms of like lumber and, and sheeting and windows and screws, like all that kind of stuff. Right. Bullets. You can just go outside and shoot. <laughs> and, and then I'm going to do that, too. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I can go outside. I can go up there for like two months. And I can just build. I can do all the projects I want to do. Yeah. I can build a well house. You have all that room for activities. I can build a sun porch. That's going to be nice, too. It's going to be a good time. You got to take advantage of this instead of being all boo-hoo about it. One thing I am looking forward to getting back to football is uh, Tom Brady going mm-hmm. to the Tampa Bay Bucks. I like this because Drew Brees coming back as well now i feel yeah. i know it's probably a little bit too late it feels like manny pacquiao and floyd mayweather to get in at the, getting together at the end of their career yeah. but now we're guaranteed two games against hall of fame quarterbacks this upcoming year i mean we're not guaranteed it because i don't think we're guaranteed an nfl season but right if a season happens we, we have these games to look forward to yeah a lot of drama in the nfc south that way right i mean you got the geriatric bowl twice a year with uh, brady and breeze uh-huh. and then you've got bridgewater Going uh, to the Panthers and like going back to play the Saints after re- resurrecting his career there with the with the Saints. That's fun. Um, and then you have Matty Ice. Who? <laughs> He's my new who guy. Yeah, David Johnson. You you've worn you've worn out that joke with David Johnson. Now you're moving on to uh, Matt Ryan. Who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't fit in that division because his uh, last name doesn't begin with B. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Who who do they need somehow to get the, now? Somehow the Falcons need to get Burroughs in the draft. You need to have Brady, Breeze, Bridgewater, Burroughs. Any other good B quarterbacks? <laughs> Not off the top of my head. You got you to gotta know this stuff, man. And I, I so I misspoke earlier when we were talking about pro football focus, grading out a poor grade for Austin Hooper. They just gave him below average. Um uh, Looking at the guys who were rated out as poor deals, Eric Flowers, uh, the Dolphins signing him mm. to a three-year, $30 million deal. It's terrible. Uh, the Bears signing former Seahawk tight end Jimmy Graham to a two-year, $16 million deal with $9 million guaranteed. Yeah, that one was odd to me. I mean, he's definitely been a player in decline for a number of years now. A good dude. I like Jimmy a lot. But... I mean, what are you doing as the front office of the Bears at that point? I mean, that's not going to save Mitch Trubisky. And now you've brought in Nick Foles. I mean, I don't know. Maybe him and Graham will have a decent connection. That's such a weird team. I feel bad for Chicago fans. I do, how too. Can a team, how can a franchise screw up the quarterback position like their entire life of their franchise? Guys like Mike Glennon and Mike Tomzak. And trading you know, up one spot, trading up one spot, to, and so, now and now they're moving on from him, from Trubisky. Your best so far, if you're a Bears fan, has been what? Jim McMahon, who was a cool game manager for a year once, and then what? Jay Cutler? Yeah. Those are, those are your two best quarterbacks in franchise history? Yeah. Rex Grossman took you to a Super Bowl. Well, he was, he was on the team when they went to a Super Bowl. I don't think he took them there. <laughs> Yeah, tough time for to be a Bears fan. They also also rated it, not just one transaction rated in the poor category. Two, mm-hmm. Robert Quinn's five year, seventy million dollar contract lands here as well. Yeah, I guess it depends on how that thing's structured. Robert Quinn is a very productive pass rusher. So yeah, I, and I think that was a guy that we were looking at. Uh, you know, maybe the Seahawks could take on. But five years, 70 million, 30 million guaranteed. I think that was a little bit higher than I think many of us were expecting. I mean, again, it depends on how the thing's structured, if they can get out of it after a couple of years. I mean, it's hard to look at total numbers and totally. I mean, 30 million is all the guaranteed part, right? Yeah. So two years, 15 million a year of the guaranteed. That's that could be that's okay. not terrible. Yeah. I like how they graded Austin Hooper as just like a below average and not terrible. So is that like 
remember on our old report cards when we were kids, you get like plus, S plus, S, S minus, minus, right? Those were the grades. Uh-huh. S being satisfactory. So it wasn't a minus. It was an S minus. Needs improvement. Yeah. At Tannehill, this contract is in this range too. So they agree with you. Almost. That's a minus. I guess they just wanted a section to to grade the worst of the worst deals. And yeah. that's where guys like Fant and Jimmy Graham ended up. Okay. NFL draft is staying put. No crowd, though. So uh, I, I wonder if Roger Goodell is going to find a way to pipe in the booze so he can feel some sense of normalcy <laughs> with the draft. <laughs> you know, I think what they need to do in that case is find some dude like from Philly. It's got to be Philly. Philly. Mm-hmm. It's got to be Philly, and you test him for Corona, right? And if he comes out negative, you sit that one dude in the audience to just heckle the hell out of Goodell <laughs> and like boo him and stuff, throw a battery at him, yeah, you know things like that. I like it. I think that actually would work. We got to find a way to work with this to like bring up the comedic value, <laughs> you know, like all the late night hosts doing their their shows without an audience. I think they need to bring in like one person that they know is good to go. I, we, we, and we spread them out, spread them out. So, you know, everybody's whatever, 15 feet from one another. So that way it's right. it, just to, for extra precautions. Yeah. Just bring it. There's gotta be a way to, to make this funnier. I know they've, they've tried like sitting in bathtubs and stuff, but I, I think we can do better here. They got time. They have about a month to put this together, to produce it. And so it can come out right. So. It's again, it'll it'll at least give us something to talk about it to help get us through this off season. All right, well. Hey, another thing we've been talking about is what we what we call the collective group of Rams, Cardinals, and 49ers. Oh yeah. Christopher Rolf at Agent of Bolas on Twitter comes in, says, Don't know if this works, but how about the Arisflar? <laughs> that can be pronounced like a word and is a combination of L A R, A A R I, and S F. Arsflar. Aris Flar. I like how it's like basically the Irish word for ass, right? At the beginning of it. Like that part is is the part that I'm gravitating to. You like that? You could you could rearrange them too. It'd be uh Sfaralar. It gets rid of the Ars. We got that's the part that has to stay. And the Lar Lars Far is would be would be the other way. We had a decent suggestion in the Ring of Honor too. But of course I'm blanking on it. It's okay if you blank on it because I think Jay Owens at JK Owens eighty one came up with an idea that I think leads to the best outcome. Oh, okay. Jay comes in and says, Catfish the Four Cara. Love your podcast, especially when Adam joins you. So it's four for 49ers. Gotcha. CA uh, for Cardinals. RA for Rams. The only thing I didn't like about this Mm -hmm. is that Cara is a word. I looked it up. It says an English, German, and Italian language feminine given name from the Latin caris, meaning darling, beloved, dear, or loved one. That doesn't really fit. So I I, I, I switched it around. Mm-hmm. The the C-A-R-A to R-A-C-A. Raka? Raka. Yeah. yeah. Which, and I googled, and I looked this up. <laughs> it's a biblical word meaning worthless or empty. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. If you go for Raka, I think this works. The four Raka teams, that's, that's solid. That's solid because it's got research behind it. <laughs> But it doesn't have an Irish curse word in it. Like, that's my only concern. Yeah. Boy, I, I'm having a hard time deciding between... Uh, Arsflar. Arsflar and Floraca. Floraca, yeah. Yeah, yeah Floraca. Okay. Well, maybe we need to put this up to a vote. I like the idea of incorporating curse words into it, though. <laughs> I, I just like the fact that it has biblical meaning behind it of, of being worthless and empty. Yeah. No, that's, it's great. <laughs> That that was that was solid work by you. Thank and you. And I think this quarantine is going to work out for everybody. <laughs> like just because of that. Like we're going to have extra time to put into these sort of things. Sure. Yeah. Kind of along those lines and a guy that didn't get to make it to these times, which is kind of a bummer. And we didn't bring this up on the last show, but uh, Mad Mike Hughes, legendary flat earther with his rocket passed <laughs> away. I, I I didn't mean to laugh there, but it, it happened. Um, He's yeah. been such a part of the show. I was sad he to has. see him go. He has in in search of his never ending quest to prove that uh, the Earth isn't shaped how it's actually shaped. Um, at least he died doing what he loved. <laughs> it's just 
But that's wow. the best thing that you can say about it, right? I think so. I like the poetry behind it. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> yeah, there's some poetic justice there, no doubt about it. I, I, it felt weird putting him in Do Better or Better at Life, so I, I felt like this was a good time to address it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to kick things off with my Do Better because earlier I talked about uh, Quentin Jefferson wanting to save something uh, to talk about the Quentin Jefferson uh, move to the Bills because they signed him on a two-year $13 million deal, $13.5 million deal. My Do Better is for WalterFootball.com, who gave the Jefferson signing an A grade by the Buffalo Bills. An A grade for Quentin Jefferson. Two years, $13.5 million deal. To me, I feel like that this is one of their best moves is not bringing Quentin Jefferson back for that uh, that amount of money. Yeah, it doesn't make sense in our cap structure. I mean, what is that, seven and a half a year or so? Yeah, a, a little under seven and uh, a little under seven. Okay, I, I couldn't remember what you said the total amount was. Yeah, so, uh, two years, 13.5, so seven and three quarters, or six and three quarters. Okay, all right, so six and change, right? That's not terrible for a rotational player that, you know, and Quentin Jefferson has talent. I oh, mean, yeah. he's a guy that has played well for us. In our situation, no, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pay that guy when you're trying to bring in bring back Clowney and, and things of that nature, but... You know, if you're the Bills, I mean, that's a nice extra piece. You didn't pay a crap ton for him. I would say for the Bills, that's closer to a B minus. Right. Yeah, it's above. It's an above average grade because it's you have Josh Allen under contract. You can afford to pay rotational type guys who are, you know, they're nice players. And and that's the way I look at Quentin Jefferson. Yes, he's a nice rotational player. And I feel like there's a, the thing going around in the stats community. There's a list. Of, of guys of pass rush productivity, and particularly at the defensive tackle spot, which Quentin Jefferson played, I don't know, 20% of his snaps at defensive tackle, but they put him up on this list with guys like Aaron Donald at the top of the most productive defensive tackle pass rushers, and you know, there's all the other big names, and you see Quentin Jefferson on that list, and it's like, oh yeah, well, that's he's done some nice things at that spot. But is he one of the 10 best Seahawks players? Because if you pay him, you know, nearly $7 million a year, he's he's in that top 10 list of best Seahawks players. And to me, that's absolutely the, the, the best move. One of the best moves from free agency to me was not bringing him back. So for him to get an A grade for this I, and a cap hit of just about $3 million less than Jaron Reed, I, I went back and I looked at Quentin Jefferson because this... <laughs> This A grade bothered me because I'm wondering what I missed and in, in how this was such a great signing by the Bills. All of his biggest games last year were against backups, against the Bengals in the first game of the season. Against the Saints, it was a backup quarterback, so I don't know who they had on the offensive line. But uh, the Rams were busted up when in that first game uh, against L.A., and had a good game against them. And then the Eagles, with their busted up offensive line later on in the season, he had a pretty good game. Everything else, he had like two pressures in all of his other games. Yeah, so I, I think really looking at defensive tackles and pinning your hopes on them being a great pass rusher is difficult to do because unless your name is John Randall, there hasn't been many guys who do it with consistency, even great players. Like Aaron Donald has up and down years. The sack numbers vary. J.J. Watt, is, and he plays outside enough to where you know he doesn't really count. I mean, maybe like Warren Sapp, like how many guys do you look back at that create consistent pressure from the D tackle spot on the quarterback? It's very, very few. So that is an aspect of playing defensive line, no doubt, rushing the passer. But when I'm looking at a D tackle, if they can do that a little bit, but are very stout against the run, that's the guy I'm looking for. Yeah. Like, I mean, Jaron Reed kind of fits that bill. Like he's been able to do it in the past. But he's great against the run. And that's got to be the number one thing you focus on. And so for this list to be focused on, well, these are the D tackles that are the best pass rushers, as if that's the most important quality of a D tackle, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And that's maybe the grade. The move doesn't bum me out at all. I think they're going to find plenty of ways to replace his 18 tackles and three and a half sacks. The idea of paying 
that much money to keep a, a, a player of Quentin Jefferson's. I like Quentin Jefferson. I don't want this to be crapping on Quentin Jefferson. I'm crapping on WalterFootball.com for giving this an A grade. Do better. <laughs> Do better. <laughs> Bad grading. That, that'd be a tough. That would have been a great teacher to have. Uh, growing up yeah you wouldn't have to do much for that hey good job buffalo hey (laughs) oh that reminds me of what's going on so with with everything going on with school yeah um yeah how are you coping at home with three kids i'm at home with no kids (laughs) makes life a lot easier it's 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 funny because well it it was going to be spring break next week anyway Mm. so maybe the um maybe their work that they're sending home will ramp up after spring break once they feel as once they uh, just dis- decide that this is going to be more of a long-term deal. Right. But they sent home work today and the kids were done in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I know in that you would like to have more to keep the kids occupied. Right. And I get all that. Yeah. But boy, I mean, let's give teachers, I, that's not going to be my better life, but let's give teachers some credit today. I mean, I have to totally rethink the way that you teach. Oh yeah. In a matter of like a week and a half and come up with a curriculum and like implement it online. Like overall, teachers are doing an amazing job with that. Teachers, and, people and that work at the underpaid. grocery store, they need a oh, lot of God. credit. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're getting hammered. <laughs> they're getting hammered and, and they're, they're having to, to do people. a bunch of extra cleaning. Yeah. Not cool. I mean, it's cool that they're doing it. They need more. Oh, I mean, it's just not cool for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tough. Ho- hopefully, we get enough people in the flock at gettingflock.com that they all get their extra $1,000 a month. Well, yeah, I mean, just another reason why you should do that. I mean, can you imagine having to live with the guilt if you were like, say we only got to 4,998, right? Yeah. And like you didn't donate. And so all those hardworking people on the front lines with this virus, like grocery store workers, teachers, you know, people like that, nurses, um, they wouldn't get their thousand dollars a month because you were too selfish to give up a dollar a month. I couldn't live with that kind of guilt. I mean, I hope the listeners can if you di- if you don't get in the flock by them. But I mean, yeah, yeah, just another reason. Just just one more reason, right? Who you got for do better? All right, my do better this week is it's for the NFL and the CBA, and only because they got the answer right with this new CBA, but they're CBA late getting the this problem solved. Mm. And I'll explain. So. I'm reading a story today, headlines, Josh Gordon intends to play in 2020 if reinstated. Yes. So many of his uh, suspensions and drug-related suspensions, the vast majority of them have been related to marijuana, correct? Mm -hmm. This new CBA comes out. They say, all right, we're not suspending for that anymore. Cool. You got it right. That's something that the players can use to cope with uh, their bodies being banged up the way they are and not have to use maybe some of the more damaging opioids and pharmaceuticals and things like that. You finally got on board. Mm -hmm. But do better is for the freaking owners and the NFL itself that it's taken them this catfishing long to figure that out. I mean, can you imagine the difference in a guy like Josh Gordon's career? The difference in his career if he had not gone through all of those suspensions over freaking weed, I mean, it would have been totally life altering for him. Oh yeah. And all because you're stubborn and stuck in these archaic ways of thinking a guy like Josh Gordon has a career totally sideswiped. And now guys would finally get that chance. And hopefully he does too. If he doesn't get reinstated, what a freaking joke show. So the old ass billionaires who couldn't figure this out beforehand and finally got the marijuana testing uh, taken away from suspensions, do better. I'm trying to think of when he went out. Did he do enough to qualify then for at least the PED side of the suspension? Now, see, on this last one, I know that there was a PED aspect, supposedly. Who knows? But it was reported I mean, as part of it. But can you imagine? I mean, he wouldn't have been at that level of testing if they hadn't have popped him for weed so many times. You know what I mean? And gone further in the program to where they test you more often. He may have never gotten popped for this last one. The weird thing about the CBA is the idea, though, that guys can get fined and can still play for uh, drug-related issues. Well, I think that makes the most sense if you're an owner, right? 
Well, so the guy gets to play, but pay it, but plays without pay essentially over the yeah. course of the suspension. I mean that, yeah, that works out for the owners, but yeah, it, does that not seem like a more uh, serious penalty in a way? Like hmm. you got to go risk your body f- without the money rather than well, stay at home, I suppose, and don't pay as much money. I Seems just like I don't, for the player safety side of it, that doesn't make sense. No, not at all. No, this the CBA doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of ways for player safety. I mean, no, I can understand. Week? I can understand why guys were against it and why guys were for it and why it was a cl- as close as it was. Uh, how many games are they playing each team? There, well, it's going to be sixteen. There's going to be expanded playoffs in 2020. Okay, so they're still only playing sixteen games. 2021 is the year that they could go to 17. They have to go to 17 in between 2021 and 2023. Or, or else it ends up being 16 games throughout the span of the CBA. So there's no way that it's going to go, every team still plays 16 games, but we have 17 weeks of football by doing an extra buy for teams or however it is that that would be done. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a no, the normal one bye week, but I think what would make sense is to have two bye weeks, right? Because then you drag out football even longer. Well, yes. And then the other thing is, is that I can't understand is, so... You play 17 games. Do half the teams in the league get an extra home game? Yeah. they. I, the, one of the things they're talking about is maybe swapping it by conference. The AFC gets an extra home game one year. The NFC gets an extra home game the next year. I hate that. It is weird. Yeah. Don't like it. I know. Doing a neutral site game for every team makes more sense to me. Yeah. I could see that. I mean, if you're really trying to promote the brand and I mean, they keep saying they want to be in Europe, right? Yeah. Las Vegas' extra game could be now. up in Oakland. Yeah, throw them a bone. Yeah. Maybe a San Diego game so the Chargers actually have fans again. They can, they can make it work. Yeah. But, all right. Well, my better at life this week is for Lisa Carlson, one of our members of the flock. Yes. You know, we've I think we've all gotten those emails from all the businesses that we've ever given our email to. And we were talking about this in our Ring of Honor Facebook group. Or <laughs> yeah. our, our members of the flock who get in the flock.com at over twelve dollars and above. Uh mm-hmm. and Lisa comes in and she came up with a, a a nice little note to share with with all the flock out there. I haven't emailed this out yet. We might workshop it a little bit more, but uh okay. with with everything that goes on, this is what she came up with. In these uncertain times, I wanted to or we, you and I, Adam, wanted to reach mm. out to you personally about what we are doing here at the Seahawkers Podcast to support you and your listening plans. As the situation around novel coronavirus COVID-19 continues to evolve, we are doing everything we can to ensure your auditory safety and provide maximum listening protection. Out of an abundance of caution, Mm. our microphones are cleaned daily, and some of our on-air talent broadcasts from a secret location. (laughs) Correct. A rotating secret location. A rotating secret. Rotating. It's not the same one. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, see, yeah. I'm glad. We, there's more that we can add to this. This is just the first paragraph. So, I mean, I got a lot of I got a lot of things that I do for OPSEC for my podcasting. Yeah. Uh, see, I'm glad you got OPSEC. Uh, you got it right this week. Yeah, I got it. I, 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 sometimes I say dumb things. I think you said spec op last week and the, the yeah. special operations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's called dyslexia, man. It's a <laughs> catfish. <laughs> So for Lisa Carlson and helping craft our COVID-19 message, at least the opening paragraph of it, uh, we'll get it. We'll get to the rest of it eventually. Lisa, yeah. better at life than Skip Bayless. Yeah, that's a great start um, because the listener's safety, the little flockers, you know, their safety. It's important. Paramount. It's paramount. Yeah. It's what we, I, it's what I go to bed sleep. Or and when we I do go not to bed. say that tongue in cheek like we have been with the thousand dollar a month payments to go out to everybody. This, that's, this is genuine. Yeah, almost. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what was the? Damn it, Adam! Uh, I'm trying to be genuine. I'm trying to have a genuine moment with our listener here. Oh, okay. We care about you, like for reals on the inside. Yeah, we're doing this for you. Yeah, for reals on the inside. This is for you. Is that better? Did, does that feel genuine to you? That, that was better. Okay. Who you got for better at life? Well, before I get to my better at life, Brandon, uh, one worry with one of the new free agent signings that has been pointed out by a couple of members of the Ring of Honor mm. is that uh, BJ Finney uh, is a saw guy. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Jason Bonner uh, reminding us he was he was the he was the guy who inspired the swamp ass weight 
SAW, <laughs> the, the SAW yeah. acronym. Yeah. So uh, apparently there's a lot of uh, swamp ass, uh, you know, weight in Finney's pants. And it was a problem for a Roethlisberger. And if Roethlisberger was grossed out by it, you know it had to be bad. Because he just seems like a dirty dude. Does it, doesn't Big Ben just seem dirty? <laughs> like the Matthew McConaughey of, uh, of NFL players? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Just a little scuzzy. Uh-huh. You know, and if he was grossed out by Finney's butt, I mean, that's a that's that's a problem. Yeah. So we know that with the signing of Finney, we cannot let go of Justin Britt. No. With his low saw score. He's got a low saw score. He got Joey Hunt, probably a low saw saw score. I think he's got a medium saw score. You think you think it's a little bit higher? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. He doesn't yeah, I have. I think because of all the extra hair, you retain extra heat, and it's got to come out somewhere, right? Mm. <laughs> There might be something to that. <laughs> Just thermodynamics, man. So Finney, he's going to be playing guard. <laughs> yes. We've confirmed it. All right. Third string center. like, well, and, and you play out of shotgun. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Well, my better at life uh, than Skip Bayless this week uh, will appreciate that Finney plays guard instead of center because for our quarterback and his lovely wife, Russell Carrington Wilson and Ciara. Now, a lot of you have probably already seen this, but... They got on the socials the other day and said that they are going to donate 1 million meals to the Seattle area uh, during the virus outbreak and all that, Uh, especially for those who haven't, uh, that don't prep, that is going to make a huge difference in people's lives. There's been a lot of athletes that have done a lot of cool stuff uh, that have reached out and really tried to help out a lot. This just happens to be our guy. That's my quarterback, man. And I couldn't be more proud of him in the way that he leads in this community. So Russell Carrington Wilson, NCR, better at life than Skip Bayless. Better at life indeed. You know, Jared Goff, you're on notice, man. You got that big that big guarantee today. You gotta hook up LA. Yeah, man. Well, I'm not gonna lie, if he didn't help out LA and it just kind of left. Like L.A. was gone now. <laughs> I would I I think the world would be better for it. We have listeners in L.A., Adam. We just talked about how they we can care. Get out first, it, this call this the warning. OK, like get out of L.A. now <laughs> so we can get rid of it. Yeah. He could also help out the Bay Area. He was a Cal guy. You didn't say the Bay Area right. You got to say it snooty <laughs> like they all do. I it's work with people the in the Bay Area. Area. I can't. Area. I don't. It's just not in me to say it snootily. It's the Bay Area. I have coworkers that are there. Look at all of us fancy pants in the Bay Area. And it's not like that. It is like that. I was just there this last summer. Not with the people that I work with. Well, there's, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, <laughs> but holy smokes. I work with the cool people. They might as well be New Yorkers in their sense of, well, if it doesn't happen in the Bay Area, it doesn't matter. I think maybe that's Southern Bay. Maybe you went, you maybe you went too far south in the Bay. I'm talking about North Bay, or, well, or well, what is it? Is, uh, e- or, is it East Bay? Bay? The East Bay people. Yeah, it's still part of the Bay Area, <laughs> and they probably tailgate with wine and cheese. And with that, there's only one thing left to say: Go Hawks! Go Hawks!